This is Billy Sutherland, pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in Brenham, Texas, and we are doing our Wednesday night live stream. We are in Matthew chapter 13, and uh, we're talking about the drag net. Drag net probably is the net that they used uh, in the, the parable, so we'll get to that in just a little bit. Uh, we are keeping an eye on COVID and adjusting accordingly. Uh, we have two sections of pews. Actually, there's four sections. So the two on the left, well, looky here first, there's a picture of the auditorium. Anybody notice anything interesting about that picture of the auditorium? The what? It's not coming up there? I'm not on the air? Hold on just a second. I'll put. Can, can you see that we're actually there or not? Okay, we're there. We're just not showing up on the... All right, folks at home, give me just a couple minutes to see if I can figure this out or not. Um, preview. No, we're not showing up there. Okay, we'll just have to figure that out later. We are live streaming, but we're not showing up here locally. Okay, that's all right. We'll deal with it. We will continue on. The Easter banners, yes, is what I was talking about. Uh, those are there ready for Palm Sunday, which is this Sunday. Can you believe that? And then the following Sunday is Easter, Resurrection Sunday. So uh, we do have the section on the left is still social distance, and the section on the right is wide open, and we're still looking at alternatives. You can facebook.com slash calvarybrenham or comments at calvarybrenham.org. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll start our Bible study tonight. Father, we thank you for your love. Thank you for this time together. Uh, give us open hearts to receive what it is you have to say to us. And um, we just praise you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have Bible study tonight. Context is crucial. Always like to mention to that. And it's good to remember that uh, what you're really looking for is what the original speaker or writer is saying to his original audience. And sometimes that requires understanding what the culture is, who it is, their style that they were speaking, the uh, issues that they were addressing. And then something that we talked about in our meeting Tuesday morning with the men, there is this growing phenomenon, I don't know you'd call it a phenomenon, just a weirdness, I think, is the red letter Christianity, which has been around for a while, but it's gaining some prominence and uh, it is particularly found in more liberal churches where they don't want to deal with the teachings of Paul uh, on some difficult subjects. Um, so they only consider the red letter in the King James Bible or any Bible that does the red letter. In other words, just the words of Christ. And the problem with that is that uh, they go a little bit further and they only select the words of Christ that they like. You know, the, the parts where he says, suppose you that I come to bring a sword, I mean, I have peace, but I bring a sword, those things they don't like. It's all about peace and love and harmony, and um, if, you, if you're not like that, then they, they overlook the warnings against false teachers. They overlook so much of what Paul has to say, so they obviously do not believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God throughout. They pick and choose the parts that they want to believe. So we agree on the non-negotiables, and I think we've kind of made up a list of these before, but they would include uh, the virgin birth of Christ, uh, his sinless life, uh, his death on the cross for atonement. There are some of those issues that are absolutely not negotiable. And then there's a broader category that you can disagree on, but I'm not going to ask you to teach Sunday school if you're way out there, but you can certainly come to church uh, being... Anybody know what's going on there? That guy's throwing a curveball, and tonight there are not going to be any curveballs. We're going to go straight with last couple of Sundays I've thrown you some curveballs, and tonight we're just going to go with casting the net and the prophet without honor, uh, straight from Matthew chapter 13, so we're at verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven, and we're emphasizing that, the kingdom of heaven. And there are kind of two phases to the kingdom of heaven, and we see this in the wheat and the tares, and we see this in the casting of the dragnet, um, that there are the wheat and the tares that grow together in the kingdom, the visible kingdom that we're in while we're on the planet, 
But then at the end of the age, Christ comes with his angels and sorts it all out. So uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind, assumed to be a dragnet, the way that it's described, that they might row out off of the shore, drop their boats, and then row in, or they even have men with ropes on the shore that are pulling the nets in, and whatever fish are in the way of the net, um, one of the things that they would consider is the size of the holes in the net, depending on how it was woven, because you don't want the minnows and the little fish. You're, you're wanting fish that you can eat or sell. So it's assumed to be a drag net. And it's kind of like Forrest Gump's life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. How many times does the subject of fish come up in the Bible? Um, how much did we say? 50, 50 times. Uh, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we had all kinds of examples of the big fish that swallowed Jonah. Jesus called the fishermen, the loaves and the fishes, the fishes that broke the net, the 153 fishes. Jesus eating broiled fish after the resurrection. The significance of that, of course, was to show the disciples, look, I'm not just a ghost or a spirit, because ghosts or spirits don't eat food. So uh, he ate a piece of the broiled fish to show them the wrong side of the boat where they had been rowing all night and trying to catch fish, and uh, Jesus told them to put the net down on the other side. And in this particular parable, the sea is similar to the field, the field with the wheat and the tares. This is the sea. Gathered every kind, both good fish and bad fish. The fishermen did not know what kind of fish they were catching. They, they sort that out after the fact. Had no idea. Um, verse 48, when it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. Did they throw the bad fish back into the sea? We don't really know, but just think about that for a minute. Why would I want to throw them back into the sea and then catch them again and then have to throw them back in the sea? I kind of imagine they probably left them in a pile there for the birds to come and eat or whatever, or maybe use them for, I don't know. But it kind of goes along with the fact that at the end of the age, um, the bad fish are thrown into the, and the good fish are sorted into. And some people try to make something out of the fact that there are containers here, that there's different levels of heaven. Uh, I, I've made a note down here. We sing the song, or maybe you haven't, but when I was a kid, we used to sing, Lord, build me just a cabin in the corner of glory land. And the other people in the church would be singing, I've got a mansion <laughs> and I want a gold harp and a crown and all that kind of a thing. I, I don't care where I end up in heaven. I just want to be there. I, I'm not, I just, I'll be thrilled to death. I don't deserve to be in heaven, so I'll be thrilled to death wherever it is I end up in heaven. Uh, so some people think that um, bad fish are good fish to others. Uh, you'll, you'll see people trying to justify, well, he's not really a, a, a bad fella, you know. He, he, he's, he's got a good heart. Okay, well, he's a mass murderer, but he's got a good heart. Um, I remember when I lived in Huntsville, we used to go to the Walls Unit, and part of the service that they had, they had teaching prisoners how to do barbershop stuff. And I'd go get my hair cut there for a dollar or two dollars. And I'm sitting in a barber chair one time, and I'm talking to this guy who's cutting my hair and making conversation, asking, what are we in for? He said, I kill my wife and children. And, and he's got the razor at my neck. <laughs> and, and I prayed <laughs> that he had a good heart <laughs> and that he had repented. Um, what some people think are bad fish, there are those who will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. We, we can fool some people here on the planet into thinking we're a good fish when we're not. But you can't fool Christ. Um, I couldn't help but in all of this fishy talk, think about when I lived in Ohio, there was a Polish-American Citizens Club, and they had a Lake Erie fish fry every Friday for some ridiculous, I think it was $4.25 for all the fish and french fries and tea you could drink and hush puppies and Boy, that was some of the good stuff. But we would go fishing, and some of the fish that we would catch were not edible. We didn't want to keep them. 
But there would be other people along the fishing pier there who would say, hey, if you catch any sheephead or shad or steelhead or whatever, let me have them. And believe it or not, we did not keep catfish. I, I, I don't know why, but way back then, that was just not something that we ate. And um, I, I'll fight you for some catfish now. <laughs> but we used to give those away because not everybody would eat catfish. Uh, only when they landed the net did they know what fish they had. And then they had to know the good from the bad. Now, these were professional fishermen. They had had enough experience knowing, boy, this fish tastes really, really good. This one sells really, really well. But these other fish, they're useless. So they would be able to sort them out. So here's a philosophical question, maybe even a the theological. Can the good fish help the bad fish become good fish? Think about that a minute. Can the good fish help the bad fish be good fish? We're just kind of out there a little bit. Maybe this is a little bit of a curveball. But if you think about it, it's not until the end of the age that the determination is made which are the good and the bad fish. It's not till the end of the age that the wheat and the tares are torn up. We are told to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now you can get into hyper-Calvinism or some other kind of you could just say, well, you know, there are those that are destined to be saved and those that are destined to be lost, you know, either the elect, and we're not going to be able to tell the difference, so we just don't need to. But the Bible tells us to preach the gospel, to share the gospel, to tell people about Jesus. So in a sense, I would think that the good fish can help the bad fish become good fish, and it's not till the end of the age or until you die that that determination is made that sets your eternal destiny. So just kind of throw that out there. You can think of it what you will. Obligation on our part is to help the lost to be saved. That's, that's what we're supposed to be doing. That's why we are a church. Verse 49, so will it be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous. It's up to them. It's not up to us. Now, does this mean that when we see false teachers, we don't identify them and call them out? I don't think so. It, we, we don't tear them out of the kingdom. That's not our job. But we can certainly warn others, hey, that's false teaching. You don't need to listen to that. As a matter of fact, Paul did quite a bit of that. And uh, we're even seeing some of that in Hebrews as we're going through Hebrews to identify the false doctrines, identify the false teachings. Paul was very blunt to Titus and he says, rebuke them sharply. Uh, you, you just don't pat them on the head and say, well, that's all well and good. You have a different opinion than we do, but, you know, we're just all going to love each other. And no, we call out false teachers, but it's not up to us to root them up and throw them out of the kingdom. That's up to God. So like the wheat and tares at the end of the age, there will come a time when it's too late to change. That, that's set. And... Again, we look at two different aspects of that. One is, once you die, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. You don't get a second chance. There are some religions that believe that, uh, for example, the Mormons, I don't mean to pick on the Mormons, but they're just a good example of some bad theology, that somebody can be baptized on your behalf. So if somebody dies and they're bound for hell, you can get baptized on their proxy baptism. That's one of the big reasons that the Mormons are so much into um, genealogy is so that they can research all of the past. And somebody right down the street here, lots of times at night, the lights are on down there because somebody is getting baptized for, they have a whole list of people there that they're getting baptized for. I would not be surprised if somebody in this room has been baptized by proxy uh, by the Mormon church. Usually it's those who have deceased, but you can't hide who you are. You can try to be a good fish, and when, when I think about bad fish, I don't know if I say this later or not. Um, when the girls were little, Chrissy and Jenny, they used to love... Um, I can't think of the name of it, the Long John Silvers. And, and, you know, they had the fish and the chicken, and they liked the chicken planks, and we liked the fish, and we used to like to go to Long John. Well, they came up with this mascot named Big Fish. 
and they had this cardboard cutout. He was about seven or eight feet tall, and he was scary looking. And our little girls would get in line. And I told the manager, I said, look, I don't know who dreamed up this character, but he's scary looking to little kids. <laughs> Mr. Big Fish, um, he wasn't hiding who he was. He was scary looking. There are some scary looking people, though, who can always put on a good front. There are some bad people who can pretend to be good people. Um, you can, when, when we were kids, we used to watch this show called Captain Penny, and he would conclude every uh, program with, and remember, you can fool some of the people all the time, and all the people some of the time, but you can't fool mom. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> well, I have managed to fool mom once or twice, maybe only because she had three other sons and five other daughters to worry about, but... And, and maybe I didn't really fool her. Maybe she was just being great. I don't know. But this I do know. This, this is indisputable. You can fool all the people some of the time and some of the people all the time, but you can't fool Jesus. You can't fool God. He knows who we are. We can't hide who we uh, are. And Christ and the angels know the good fish from the bad fish. They are even better experts on good and bad fish than the fishermen, than the professional fishermen are. Verse 50, and throw them into the fiery furnace in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I know there are various concepts of hell. I know that people, some people believe in total annihilation, you know, right when you die, and other people believe it's going to be long suffering. And there's different levels of hell. We read of Tartarus, where the uh, angels who kept not their first estate there combined. And when I was younger, it was the big thing to preach a hellfire sermon, and we would even have evangelists come, and they would have the preacher turn up the thermostat and make it nice and hot in the auditorium, and they'd preach a hellfire sermon and try to scare people into... And, and I'm just not into that. I, I'm, I think if you scare people into hell, you got to keep them scared. I would rather love them into heaven. And I, I want people to come to heaven because they know who Jesus is and what he did for them, and the price that he paid for them. I want them to come because they love Jesus, not because they're buying hell insurance or fire insurance. So that's uh, in, you know, totally up to you, but uh, I think when we preach the gospel, we're relying on the Holy Spirit anyway. So preach the word and like we say, share Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit and leave the results to God. Then verse 51 have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of I kind of get a giggle out of that because the disciples weren't always the quickest on the uptake. There were a lot of times that they weren't real sharp. Some of them did not believe until after the resurrection. Um, some of them would ask each other questions and they had to get scolded. Um, on the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, the whole business of, well, we'll build tabernacles. And God said, quiet. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Uh, they could come up with some dumb things. So I have to wonder, did they really understand? Um, the Bible doesn't say they understood. The Bible says, and they said to him, yes. Have you ever said that you understand something that you don't understand? Can you... Can, yeah, probably. Um, I, so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. When, when somebody's trying to beat something into you and, and you don't get it, you're not going to get it, but you just want them to say, okay, yeah, I get it, I get it. Or to say face interview. Or to say face interview, yeah. And, and what's really bad, I've used the example before, like when my wife is, is telling me something and, and she'll say, did you hear what I said? And, and I want really bad to say yes, but I know that the follow-up question is going to be, what did I say? <laughs> so I think I generally say something like, why don't you just kick me in the stomach and get it over with? <laughs> I hope she's not at home watching. <clears throat> uh, sometimes we answer the question yes because we don't want to look foolish. Sometimes we answer yes because we just want them to stop talking. I really don't know what's going on here. It says that they said yes. Um, I don't know if they did or not. 
do we have to understand everything everybody feels? When somebody tells us, you know, do we have to say, yes, I understand? No. And I use the example, a lot of times God allows things to happen in my life that become life lessons. And I've shared this one before, but it fits so well here. At invitation time, when the lady came forward during invitation, and, and I met her at the front, and I said, how can I help you? And she said, I'm afraid of the dark. And it literally caught me. They don't teach that in seminary. You know, what is the theological response for I'm scared of the dark? And while I was trying to think of how to respond to that, my mouth opened and words came out. A lot of times that's not good. This time it was. I said, that really bothers you, doesn't it? And she began to weep and cry and say, you understand. And I didn't understand. But I did understand that it was really bothersome to her. And I think that's all she really cared about, is that somebody understands that this is a real problem. To her, rather than to stand there and say, well, that's about the dumbest thing I've ever heard. So we don't have to understand. But here's a good life lesson, too. Jesus does understand everything. So while I don't know if the disciples really did understand when they said yes, but Jesus always does. So um, verse 52, excuse me, let me go back to that. Get rid of that little thing, whatever that is. And he said to them, so first of all, he asked, did you understand all of this? And then he comes to this statement. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. I got nothing. I, I'm not really quite sure what that is supposed to mean. I've looked at some commentaries and I've seen that some say the old and new, as in provision, since it's talking about the master of the house, that he's got the, the, the grain and the goods for, you know, to feed his family. And you don't just always shovel out what's new because the old in retail, we call that rotation of stock. You know, you, you face the older stuff and you put the new stuff in behind it so that you're... Now, I always cheat when I buy milk. You probably do this too. I look at the dates and I look for the latest date. You know, some of them are almost next year and I figure that will last the longest. But sometimes you have to reach way back into the back of the cooler. <laughs> Because they want you to buy the stuff that's about to expire. That's the way some explain it. Some explain it's the Old and the New Testaments or the Old and the New Covenants. Anybody have some thoughts on what's here? Anybody? I'm open. Nobody? Jim, you've always got a thought. Well, if he used the word scribe. Yes, he's, he, good point. Okay. So to me, uh, these guys have become disciples yes. of the kingdom. Yes. So they are able within their treasures, within the things they hold dear and believe, some of the old, which were from the masters that they had written previously, plus the new that they're hearing from Jesus. So that kind of goes along with the Old and the New Testaments, the Old and the New Covenants, the old way that we learn to do things, the new way that Jesus, how many times Jesus said, you've heard it said, but I say, I'll buy that. Anybody else? See, we're not real cold-hearted. <laughs> we have that airplane mode again thing. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there. And we find this frequently that there's a change of scenery, a change of topic, a change of location. One of the things that that does is because they walk where they're going, there's plenty of time to contemplate. What was he talking about? What did that mean? And I imagine that the disciples are locked, you know, they're not necessarily all bunched up in a group, but I imagine Peter, James, and John, you know, they ended up pairing off, or I guess it wouldn't be pairing off if there's three of them, but they ended up being a group together. And, and I can imagine them kind of falling aside and as they're walking what do you think he meant when he said this there's room to contemplate in today's world uh, so many times there's a teaching and then boom we're off and we're doing something else and we don't ever think about it again in the old days after church 
families would go home and have family lunch, dinner, I guess you'd call it. And there would be an opportunity to say, hey, when the pastor said this, what do you think he meant? And there would be an opportunity to discuss. And the disciples had plenty of time to do that because they didn't have iPhones and TVs and radio and all the distractions, movies, all the distractions that we have. And they maybe even could have been thinking up more questions. Again, because the Bible doesn't tell us all that ever happened, we don't know that there were actually some of these things as they're traveling, because it's a long way to travel between some of the places that they went, that there may have been other discussions that are going that are not written down. Uh, we don't know, but I think it's safe to assume that there were. But there was time to digest what was taught, time to think on it. Verse 54, And coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Now, how likely is it that they didn't know Jesus and the stories about his miracles? And, you know, word travels fast. And like I said, there wasn't TV and Internet. So, you know, you had a good story, you told it. But they're astounded, they're amazed. It was not at all unusual to have a guest rabbi in the synagogues to teach. They'd have the reading of the Torah and they had their service and I think that just before COVID, we had actually talked about getting a group together to go to a Jewish synagogue and sit through their service. I think I'll look into that again. Um, sometimes you will find a synagogue that is open to that. Sometimes they say, no, we don't want any goyim, you know, not Jewish people. But sometimes you'll find a synagogue that, that's open to, uh, and I have taken youth groups before to a Jewish synagogue, and they sit us in a special place. And the rabbi is gracious enough to explain to us, now we're going to take the Torah and this is what we do. And, and it, it's, it's an object lesson. I mean, it's a good lesson for us. While they're going through their service, he explains to us, because everything is in Hebrew. And he'll, you know, and they, they sing there like you heard. Um, Bill. <laughs> Thank you. I was thinking of Bruce. Bill, <laughs> I'm getting stage whispering from the audience. As you heard, Bill, you know, he sings the prayer, and they do a lot of that in the Jewish synagogue. It's not unusual to have a guest rabbi, and everybody would come to hear. Even the Gentiles would come, and they'd stand outside of the synagogue, because uh, when we were the one in um, Capernaum, um, it's pillars, and there's open seating, and you could stand outside and hear what was being taught. How could they not have heard about Jesus? But they got this block, this mental block, but we know him. He's, and we'll go through that. They said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? So they obviously know about the mighty works. That was part of their question. So verse 55, is this not the carpenter's son? And when we hear about Jesus the carpenter, this is one of the references you know, you did what your father did. People assume, well, Jesus was the carpenter, and this is one of the places that we see that. Is not his mother called Mary? We know his parents. And again, that reminds me of my first day in high school when I decided I could act up. And when they're called on the roll, and they called my name, and the teacher looked over his glasses, and he said, Mr. Sutherland, I know Earl and Ruth. He knew my parents by their first name. I knew I was in trouble. I knew I wasn't going to get away with a whole lot of anything. They know Jesus' parents. Uh, they knew his family. He's like a neighborhood kid. And, and I don't mean that in any disrespect whatsoever, but there are people who were adults when Jesus was growing up as a child. And, and they would know him as the boy that grew up, and of course in the temple, and he amazed the doctors and the teachers and so on. But he would be kind of like today... We don't hear this term too much anymore, but a preacher boy. When somebody surrenders to the ministry, you know, one of the things their home church will do is they'll allow them to preach in the, the church service that, you know, some Sunday morning. And they fully expect him to make mistakes because this is going to be his first time. But it's kind of the loving, and it's almost like a pat on the back, you know. Well, come on, you can preach the sermon, and we'll tolerate it and pretend like we like it. and <laughs> Maybe even throw in a couple of amens to make you feel good. But it's not like the trained evangelist who comes. 
It's a total different setting. Somebody coming from far away is thought to be special. And, and this, even in our society today, um, one of the explanations for expert was somebody more than 50 miles out of town. Um, that's an expert. If it's somebody in your plant who knows way more about that guy, that's beside the point. He's from here. The expert traveled 50 miles to get here. He's the one we need to listen to. Um, the definition of an expert, I got room for you to write that character. This is, this is precious. X means has been, and spurt means a drip under pressure. <laughs> okay. When a visiting preacher says the same thing you said, people marvel. Now this used to, I'm serious, this used to get under my craw. I'd be preached my heart about something in a church, you know, many years ago. And then you'd have an evangelist come, and he'd say the exact same thing I'd been saying, and people would get saved. Or they'd marvel, you know, that, wow, isn't that brilliant? And I'm thinking, I've been telling you people that for six months. But he's the evangelist, he's the expert, he's the preacher that's come from far away. And Jesus is this kid that grew up in our neighborhood, and we know his parents, and we know his brothers, and we know his sisters. Now, notice that his brothers are named, the sisters are not, and are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? He didn't go off to seminary, waxing eloquent. You remember I used the example... Years ago in a business meeting, one of our deacons stood up and he was waxing eloquent. He was, just, he was just so puffed up and he was just, you know, talking away. And Miss Heron, our secretary, she was about 105 years old and she called him by name. I won't use this name since we're live broadcasting. And she said, I used to change your diapers. And boy, that put him in his place. And he turned purple and he sat back down. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but there were probably people there who changed Jesus' diapers. There were probably, you know, relatives. There were probably, i got to do something and take care of Jesus for a little bit. They, they knew him growing up as, as a child. Uh, when a visiting preacher comes, all you know is his fame. All you know is a lot of times they'll have this big resume, you know, and I, I get so tired sometimes. Sometimes the resume is longer than the speech. I've been to several meetings, even here in Brenham, where they'll say, and Dr. So-and-so, you know, he wrote this book and he did this, and they go on and on and on and on. I, I like when uh, Dr. Paul Payne was one of my seminary professors, and um, I think I had four, cl four classes that semester, and each of them would give their big biography and tell us who they were and how important. When it came Dr. Paul Payne's time, he said, my name is Paul Payne, I'm a teacher here. If I weren't qualified to teach, I wouldn't be here. Open your Bibles too. That was his introduction. And I thought, well, you know, that's true. If he wasn't qualified to be here, he wouldn't be standing up there teaching. And uh, I got a whole lot more out of his. He just had that attitude, you know, I'm not here to tell you how important I am. I'm here to tell you about Jesus. When a visiting preacher comes, all you know is his name. You don't know about his personal life, his own sins, his crazy aunt. You don't know any of that. But when it's somebody local, you know all kinds of stuff about them that kind of takes the shine off of, you know, the, the big shot that they are. Uh, verse 57, and they took offense at him. They're always taking offense at Jesus, aren't they? Even today. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And we pretty much covered a lot of that. Not at all unusual to take offense at Jesus, who spoke with authority. Somebody coming from headquarters, you know, a lot of times in business you got the main big guy coming from headquarters uh, I remember when I left the linear business products I resigned because I was being called into full-time ministry and they sent the head guy from Atlanta to Tyler to take me out to lunch and he took me to the steak place really nice steak place and uh, he started off he said well he said you probably know why I'm here and I said well you're either going to tell me that I don't need to wait the two weeks I can go ahead and pack up now <laughs> Or are you going to try to talk me into staying? And he kind of laughed and he said, yeah, I'm here to talk you into staying. He said, but I understand that you've surrendered to the ministry and, and that's what you feel God wants you to do. And I said, yes, sir. He said, then let's just enjoy a good steak dinner. And, and I appreciated that. There was no pressure, no you know, temptation, no 
and we had a good time and talked and he shared he was uh, in Charles Stanley's church and he shared about some things that were there and it was a good enjoyable time and I left that company on very good terms but a hometown boy that's what Jesus was to a lot of these people and they did not honor him as who he is verse 58 and he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief there is so much here but it's going to be really easy to hit it not mighty works so maybe he did some not so mighty works and not many mighty works so it doesn't say he didn't do any works he didn't do anything mighty and he didn't do a whole bunch of anything but it doesn't say that he couldn't it says that he did not some of your versions might say he would not but I don't think any of them say he could not um, not that he could not how much more would he do if we simply believed he would? How much more would he have done there if they simply believed in who he was? And just kind of closing with, we used to hear stories from our missionaries in China and Korea and, or South Korea and you know, different parts of the world, and they, they talk about some, some powerful, remarkable healings or some miracles that they had seen among the people and I remember the question would be, how were they able to do those miracles? Or why did those miracles happen? And the answer was because nobody told them they couldn't. They believed God for who he was. They believed that God, when he wanted to, could do a mighty work. And I wonder how many times we limit God because we don't believe who he is or what he can do just something to think about on your way home. Anybody comments or questions before we wrap up live stream? One thing, uh, Billy, to me, when I look at the end and, and he did not do what he could have done. Yes. But the fact remains that in his hometown, they acknowledged his supernatural wisdom and miraculous power. Yes. And, and that comes back to what we've talked about before. Unbelief is different than lack of faith because it's kind of like they chose not to. They, they knew of his mighty works, but they focused more on his humanity instead of his deity. So it's kind of like they chose not to believe who he was. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anything else? Good stuff. Yes, sir. Sir? Yes, yeah. There are people who don't believe because they're ignorant of the truth. But when you are, when you've seen the miracles and you've seen God work and you still choose, then you are in unbelief. It's more of a where we were talking about the unpardonable sin, where you absolutely refuse, or even worse, you attribute His mighty works to Satan rather than to the Holy Spirit. Anybody else? Anything else? Yes, sir. That's dangerous. Yes, sir. It's dangerous when your heart is hardened against the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time and your word tonight. Thank you, Father, for the fact that your word tells us everything that we need to know. It doesn't tell us all that we want to know. Sometimes we scratch our heads trying to figure something out. Sometimes we kind of wonder that maybe when we get to heaven, we're going to figure out that we've got a lot of things wrong. But I pray, Father, that you would help us to be faithful to those parts of Scripture that we do understand and to be obedient and uh, to be your, your children. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.